Years ago, my brother-in-law, Diane's brother, he's an actor, <clears throat> and he was in one of those Got Milk commercials. You remember those? And he was, he was in one where he comes down to breakfast and pours some cereal, and uh, he looks up and there's a baby in the high chair with a bottle of milk and the cat on the counter with a bowl of milk, and he has no milk for his cereal. And so it's very funny, and they, I want to spoil the punchline, but you can look that up online. It's, it's the standoff version of it. But it was a great marketing campaign. It caused a lot of people to think about all the reasons why milk is so important to them. The dairy farmers loved it. Well, one of them showed a man who had died, and he's not sure if he's gone to heaven or hell, but when he arrives there, he finds these gigantic chocolate, cook chocolate chip cookies everywhere. And he is so excited. This must be heaven. And he starts eating this giant chocolate chip cookie, and he goes over and he opens the refrigerator door, and all the milk cartons are empty. <laughs> and he realizes he's actually in, yeah. Well, it was a humorous way of talking about that. It made me think about the reality, especially with all the memorial services recently, when people die. The reality of death and the finality of death, and Hebrews reminds us that after we die comes the judgment. And when you think about that, I think about so many things that people trust in. So many folks are trusting in different elements of their own life or their religion to get them to heaven. But they really don't have assurance if they're missing the one and only way to get there. And that's what John reminds us of in this chapter 5 of 1 John. If you would turn there, I believe he's asking a question. He wants us to know that we have eternal life. And instead of saying, got milk, his question is, got Jesus? Fascinating question, isn't it? Not, do you believe this? Do you know that? Do you attend church? But, do you got Jesus? It's a funny way of asking if you know for sure you have eternal life. But it drives home the whole point of this incredible epistle. We've been studying it for some time. John gives us these repeated tests of genuine fellowship with God. Each cycle of tests, there are three cycles of similar tests. It's the same concept each time. There's a moral test, a doctrinal test, and a social test. Are you walking in obedience to the commands of Jesus in the Word of, in the word of God? Are you one who loves God and loves your fellow man, and do you believe the truth about the biblical Jesus? And in those tests, we've come to now the last cycle. We looked at the social test, is the love of God in you? And now we're looking at the doctrinal test in chapter five, verses one through 12. And John focuses on two very critical doctrinal questions. The first question is, how can I be sure I have genuine salvation? And the second one was absolutely essential, how can I be sure I have the genuine Savior? See, you can't have genuine salvation without the genuine Savior. And so last time we looked at genuine salvation, we said the root of that is being born of God, being born from above, being born again, different ways you can say that. The new birth is the root of genuine salvation. If you have the new birth, you are genuinely saved. But if the root is there, the fruit will be evident. It will be characteristic of your life, not hit and miss, not on occasion. The general tenor of your life, not perfection, but direction, will be four things. There'll be the biblical faith. In other words, you trust exclusively in the Jesus of the Bible. You'll have a love for God and his children, both and, not either or. You will walk in obedience. You will actually delight in the law of God. And then you'll have victory over the world. You'll overcome sin and temptation by his power. So having described that, that genuine salvation, he now moves on to the other element of it. He wants us to understand that in order to have genuine salvation, you have to have the right object of your faith. It's the person you believe in that it's critical. You cannot have a fake or imaginary Jesus and make it to heaven. You say, well, that's kind of weird, a fake or imaginary Jesus. Are there false Christs in our world? Are there different kinds of Jesuses that people say they believe in? So 
when people say, I believe in Jesus, you have to ask them, tell me about your Jesus. Who is he? They might come knocking at your door. Oh yeah, we believe in Jesus and he's going to come and have a kingdom here. Tell me who he is. Because if he's the wrong Jesus, he cannot give you salvation. With that said, let's look at verses 6 through 12, the genuine Savior. I frequently hear people say this thing, and it always sounds very appealing. When they say, you realize that all religions lead us to God. All religions will ultimately lead us to heaven. God may go by a different name. He might have different paths, but they all lead to the same place. It doesn't matter which one you believe in as long as you believe in one of them and you're sincere in your belief. Have you ever heard that from people? It is so very common, but it's not true. They would say that the key is faith and you need to have a sincere faith. But let me ask you, is it possible to have a sincere faith and still not go to heaven? Yeah. In fact, when Jesus confronted that with the most religious people on the planet of his time, he ultimately said to them, depart from me, I never knew you. They believed in God, they believed in the God of the Bible. But demons also believe and tremble, right? So you have to have the right gospel, you have to have the right savior. It doesn't matter how sincere your faith is. Let me give you an example. Have you ever heard of nuclear weapons? If I put on a Kevlar vest and a nuclear bomb explodes in this room, is that gonna help? Eh, It might slow it down a hair, but I'm pretty much toast, right? But if I have sincere faith in that Kevlar vest, will that help me? No, because the object of my faith is not sufficient to protect me. And that's what John wants to get across here to us. It is possible to sincerely believe in a false Jesus that cannot deliver you from the wrath of God. Now, to give you just a little support for that, there's many religions and cults that acknowledge a Jesus. But Jesus warned in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will arise, will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead if possible even the elect. So I wanna contrast for you just for a moment here, just to paint this picture, the difference between the Jesus of the Bible and the Jesus of major religions and major cults. Judaism says that Jesus was Mary's son. He was a respected teacher. He had many disciples. He claimed to be Messiah. He was crucified, and his disciples claimed that he rose from the dead. But he did not. He was just a man. He was not God or God's son. Islam says Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary. He is to be revered. One of God's most important prophets was a wise teacher and miracle worker. He did not, however, die on the cross. See, they believe that Jesus did not die. Jesus was taken bodily into heaven. Somebody else died on the cross, and oftentimes they'll say it was Judas. He ascended to heaven in bodily form. He will come again as a Muslim and a follower of Muhammad, he was not God nor the Son of God because God doesn't have a son. Is that a different Jesus? Hinduism says Jesus was a holy man, a wise teacher, and a God, one of 300 million gods. But he wasn't the God and the only way to heaven. Buddhism says Jesus was an enlightened man and a wise teacher. The New Age movement says similar that Jesus was a wise moral teacher and a great example for us. The Jehovah's Witnesses say Jesus was the first being created by God, then he created everything else. Before coming to earth, he was Michael the archangel. He is not God, there is no Trinity. The Latter-day Saints, or commonly known as Mormons, say Jesus was the son of God along with his half-brother Lucifer. He was the offspring of God, and God, by the way, has a physical body, and that God had sex with the Virgin Mary, and that's how Jesus came into being. 
God has many celestial wives and he is one of many, many gods in the universe. We just deal with him. Do you see any differences between those and the biblical Jesus? So when someone says, I believe in Jesus, it may or may not be a Jesus that can deliver them. And it's critical that we know what the Bible says about Jesus, that our faith is in the biblical Jesus who alone can save. Amen? Amen. So with that in mind, let's take a look at how John gives us testimony or evidence concerning the genuine Savior. Now let's look at this. God's testimony concerning the genuine Savior in verses 6 through 9. He's going to give us two lines of testimony. He's going to give us the first line that there are three who agree about the true Jesus, the water, blood, and spirit. Now, he just said in verse 5 that Jesus is the Son of God. Look with me at verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. Not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. It is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now let me give you two footnotes about this. For those of you who have studied this passage and have heard a bunch of messages on this passage, footnote number one. Many Bible students say this is one of the most, if not the most difficult passage in the Bible to interpret. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that in his commentary, that this is the most difficult passage to interpret in all of the Scripture. Second footnote, the King James Version has an additional statement added to this text. If you have a New American Standard Translation and have the one with the reference, you might look in the column and notice that there is a footnote there with an additional sentence that is added in the King James, but in no other of the translations. It says there, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, that would be a very powerful verse if it was really in the Bible, because that would be the clearest statement anywhere in Scripture as to the Trinity, stating emphatically clear that you got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in heaven, and they all agree that they are one. But that statement is absent from every early manuscript. In fact, there's only four New Testament manuscripts you can find anywhere, and they start as late as the 1500s. If it was in the original text, it would be a great defense of the Trinity, but none of the early church fathers who were defending the Trinity in all kinds of disagreements and arguments and councils, none of them ever quoted that. Even though they quote these passages, they never quoted that. It was added by a Roman Catholic scholar named Erasmus in the year 1522. And he, he included a footnote saying he had strong suspicions that it wasn't correct. So that ended up in the King James Version of the Bible. I don't say that to diminish the King James. It's a fantastic translation. I just believe in that particular situation, it was not original text. That's why it's in the marginal notes everywhere else. So with that said, let's take a look at this passage and see if we can understand it, what John is trying to say. He starts off by saying, this is the one who came. Now, when you read the Gospels, you'll hear that phrase repeated, the one who came, the one who came. It's referring to the one who came in fulfillment of Messianic prophecy, that the Christ, the Messiah, came. He lived, he existed, he was here on earth. But it says he came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water only, but with the water and with the blood. Now, Jesus Christ, and by the way, when people say Jesus Christ, would you help them understand that Christ is in his last name? A lot of people think that, is Jesus and his last name was Christ. No, Jesus' name and Christ is his title. It's the Greek word Christos that refers to the anointed one. In Hebrew, it would be Hamashiach, it's the, the Messiah. So he is the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one who was promised, who would come and be the savior of mankind. So he says, there's this testimony by water and blood about Jesus the Christ. 
Jesus, the man born in Bethlehem, he was human. He fully identified with us. Jesus, Yeshua in Hebrew, Yahweh saves. God bringing salvation to man. And so we understand that this man, Jesus, was fully man, but he was also the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one. He was God in human flesh. He's the God-man. The fulfillment of all Old Testament promises. Isaiah 9, 6 described him as mighty God. That's who the Messiah is. Jesus is mighty God in human flesh, the Father of eternity. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In verse 14, he became flesh and dwelt among us. So this Jesus, the Christ, is the God-man who came to deliver us from sin. Now, what is he saying then when he's referring to water and blood? Well, there's different views. One view says that the water and blood refers to the spear that was put in Jesus' side when he was on the cross and they thought he was dead. To make sure he was dead, they put a spear in there and water and blood flowed out. And many think that that's it. That was the testimony that Jesus actually died for us. That view was actually held by St. Augustine. But I don't think that's correct because John's countering a heresy. John is dealing with something specific at that time that is still around today. It's a heresy that said in dualism that spirit was good and matter was evil. The physical is evil. So you have this idea that your body is bad and your spirit is just carried around inside there for a while and it's good. So what you want is to get the spirit removed from the body so it can ascend up and be where there's all this goodness. You see that in the New Age movement. You see that in so many belief systems today. But that's not true. That whole belief system is not right. John is countering a heresy that said, Jesus was just a man. At his baptism, the Spirit of God came down and made him the Christ, or the Christ Spirit came down and infused him. And right before the crucifixion, that Spirit, the Christ, went back to heaven, and only the man died. Because the spirit can't die, so the spirit can't be killed, the spirit is good, so the man went to the cross, not the Christ. And John is countering that heresy, saying, no, he had to be both God and man the entire time. Our others said that water and blood refers to baptism and the Lord's Supper. This was the view held by Luther and Calvin. Now, I disagree with them here as well, and I understand whenever you disagree with Luther and Calvin, you better have good rationale. But I believe that John is not talking about symbols here. He's not talking about different ordinances that we carry out. He's talking about something that happened in the life of Christ. This water and this blood has to be something about what he came to accomplish, the one who came. It has to identify him as the Son of God and the Messiah. So that brings me to the third view that I personally hold to, and we can debate this if you want. You can write me very nice letters. You can take me out to a nice dinner. We could even discuss it. This is actually the oldest view. It was espoused by a man named Tertullian in the second and third centuries AD. There is no view earlier than this one that we can find. He says the water refers to the baptism of Jesus. This was the beginning of his public ministry. And the blood refers to the death of Jesus on the cross. So the beginning of his public ministry and the ending of his public ministry, in both situations, Jesus was the, the Christ, the Messiah. He never changed. In fact, from the moment of conception, he was the God-man. He was the Christ, the Messiah, the Savior of all mankind. When he was baptized, he fully identified with us and revealed to us that we needed, as John baptized, we needed to repent. We needed to be cleansed of sin. And by the way, when John baptized, this is fascinating, John's baptism of repentance was a repentance that was normally given to Gentiles, when they wanted to become a proselyte, when they wanted to become a Jew, they would go into these waters of baptism, repent of everything they used to believe, and acknowledge the God of Israel. But John comes along and says to the Jews, you need this repentance. 
You need this baptism. And Jesus comes along and says to John, you know what? I need to do this too to fulfill all righteousness. What do you mean, Jesus? Jesus did not need to repent of sin, did he? Jesus did not need to be brought into a right relationship with God, did he? But we needed him to do that. So he fully identified with us in baptism and began that ministry. Then at the end of that three plus year ministry, he went to the cross and he died, fully identifying with us, paying the price in full. And that's what John is highlighting here. Those two outer marks of the ministry of Jesus proclaim that he was the Christ at the beginning, he was the Christ at the end, and by the way, he's still the Christ today. Now, why is this important? This is the Jesus you must believe in in order to be saved. Every other Jesus is a fake. Every other Jesus has been presented by religions and isms is a lie and cannot save you because that Jesus does not exist. Only the true Jesus can deliver anybody who comes to him by faith. And we need Jesus to be fully God and fully man from the moment of conception all the way through eternity, don't we? If he's gonna deliver us, he can't stop being one of us. He has to be one of us to deliver us from the coming wrath of God. So at any moment that he's not fully God and fully man, there is no gospel. John goes on to say, it is the Spirit who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. So he has said there's the water and the blood that testifies, and now he says the Spirit testifies, for there are three that testify, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and the three are in agreement. Now people just do weird things all over the place with this past, like what in the world is he talking about? And it's really simply this. You have the testimony of the life and ministry of Jesus at his baptism at the beginning, at his death at the end, and you have the ongoing testimony of the Spirit. You have an external testimony of the life of Jesus. You have an internal testimony of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that fantastic? So God is still testifying through the Spirit. Notice he says it is the Spirit who testifies present tense and he agrees with those first two witnesses and by the way the spirit is the truth jesus said this in john 15 26 when the helper comes whom i will send to you from the father that is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father he will testify about me jesus is saying i'm going to send the holy spirit after i'm gone and he will continue this testimony he will continue to reveal me to you he will continue to open your eyes to understand who i really am and the spirit continues to approve the message that jesus is the son of god and the christ how does he do that how does the holy spirit even now testify to us that jesus is the son of god and is the christ well there are several ways let me just give you a few of them and you can think of more on your own first of all in the prophetic scripture that he inspired whenever you read the scripture you are hearing the testimony of who the spirit who inspired the scripture. So God, through the spirit, the spirit is God, he revealed to us God's plan. So when you read Old Testament prophecies about the public ministry and death of the Messiah, you are hearing his testimony. When you read the New Testament record of the gospel and Acts, when you read about how God used the resurrected Christ and the lives and the founding of the church, you understand his testimony. In John 1, 29 through 34, the Spirit revealed to John the Baptist and said to him, you will recognize the Messiah at his birth because the Spirit of God's gonna descend on him, exactly as it happened. So John the Baptist had the testimony of the Spirit. The Old and New Testament gives us the testimony of the Spirit. In Matthew 3, 16, when Jesus came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and it became obvious that this is the son of god and in luke 23 42 the thief on the cross remember there's three of them hanging there and the one on the cross who was an evil wicked man 
who had done things deserving of death. The Spirit testified to him, that one's not guilty. That one's the Messiah. Amen. That one can take you to paradise. And he says, Lord, remember me. And Jesus said, today, you will be with me in paradise. Every time anyone believes that Jesus is the Son of God, the Christ, it's because the Holy Spirit testifies to them. Has he testified to you? Mark 15, 39, the Spirit revealed to the centurion. Remember the centurion there at the, at the crucifixion of Jesus? John Wayne played him in one of the movies. Truly, this was the Son of God. You know, I don't know how he says it, but however, however he talks. How did he know that? The Spirit bore witness. In Romans 1, 4, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead gives a public testimony that he is the one and only Son of God. So the water, the blood, and the Spirit they agree. Why does John even say it this way? Why is it important that three of them agree? Because under Old Testament law, if you were ever to have a court situation, you had to have at least two or three witnesses that agreed for something to be believable. And so John says, here's your three witnesses. The, the, the water, the blood, and the spirit and they all say the same thing about who Jesus really is. But John adds to the testimony of the three, and in verse 9, he says their testimony is in fact, in reality, is actually the testimony of God. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his what? His son. Now, in this text, you see the word testimony, testimony, testify, testify, testimony, testimony. You see the word son, son, son of God, son, son of God, repeatedly. John's trying to drive this home. The consistent testimony is that Jesus is the son of God, the Christ, the Messiah. And God himself is the ultimate witness of this fact. And his testimony is stronger than anyone else because God cannot lie, amen? And God cannot be deceived. Any human witness might be wrong. You could have four people observe a car accident and come up with different testimonies on what happened, but God knows exactly what happened and he always tells the truth. And God has testified concerning his son. When did that happen with the water and the blood? Well, you remember Matthew 3:17? At the baptism of Jesus, the clouds open and a voice comes down from heaven. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. At the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, verse 5, when Jesus, all of a sudden, the veil is removed and they saw his glory for a moment. The voice came down, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And then, at the crucifixion, for three hours, God brought supernatural darkness over the land. A testimony that this is my son dying for you. And then at the end of that three hours, God tore the veil in two in the temple and brought a great earthquake and raised saints from the dead who went into Jerusalem testifying that Jesus was Messiah. Did God testify that Jesus is who he says he is? Oh, he sure did. He sure did. Yet so many religious people miss this. The testimony is consistent. Jesus is God in human flesh. He is the God-man sent by God to be the Christ, Messiah, and Savior of the world. But God's testimony isn't done because he testifies who the genuine savior is, the person of Christ, and then in these last few verses, he testifies as to the work of the savior. 
genuine salvation. So let's take a look at that, verses 10 through 12. And there's four key elements in here as to what genuine saving faith involves. John points them out in these three verses. In other words, you must believe these things if you'll ever have assurance of eternal life. And we've gone over this repeatedly. Every time I preach, I almost make reference to this because it needs to be repeated. By the way, do you only need the gospel when you get saved? Do you need the gospel every day? Oh, folks, how we desperately need to be reminded that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, my resurrected Savior who's coming back and is going to establish his kingdom and I will dwell with him forever. I need to be reminded of that. Do you? Because I fall daily. You're going, then why are you the pastor? I don't know. I really don't know. But God in his sense of humor said, go ahead, put him up there. It's the foolish things of the world anyway. What is God's testimony as to what you must believe to experience genuine salvation? Number one, you must believe in the person of Jesus alone. Look at verse 10. The one who believes in the who? Son of God, has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his what? His son. The issue here is the person of Jesus. You must believe in the person of Jesus as Son of God, Lord and Savior, if you're gonna have this internal testimony. When you talk to most religious people, they don't have any assurance that they have eternal life. They hope, they wonder, they want it, but they're not sure. They're always questioning, and if every time they do something wrong, every time something wrong in their life happens, they think, oh no, God's against me now. But if you want this testimony in you, you must trust exclusively in the person of Jesus the Christ. Romans 8, 15 and 16 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. When you trust in the person Jesus, not a religion, not a bunch of principles, not a bunch of do's and don'ts, you trust in him, then the Spirit bears testimony with you. But I want you to see something that's often missed here. Look in verse 5 of 1 John 5, and he says there, you must believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You must believe that fact. But notice what he says here in this verse 10. You must believe in the Son of God. Now, there's a very critical distinction here because the Greek word literally means into. You must believe into the Son of God. You must believe into Jesus the Christ. What do you mean by that? It's not enough just to believe the facts. You must believe into Jesus exclusively Put your trust in him alone. He's your only hope. And there's nothing else you can add to him. I must believe into Jesus. Now, negatively, if you do not believe in God's testimony about his son, Jesus Christ, and you're calling God a what? That ought to be scary. That ought to scare every religious person on the planet. Everybody who says Jesus is not God, everybody who says Jesus was created, everybody who says Christ left him and he he was never crucified, he didn't rise from the dead, everybody who says that, no matter what else they believe, they're calling God a liar. Now, you might intellectually agree that Jesus was who the Bible says he is, but if you don't turn from sin and trust in him exclusively, you're saying God's a liar. And there are a lot of people like that. They've heard the gospel. They intellectually go, you know, I, I, I kind of like that idea. But they don't think it's entirely true. 
They'll say things like, no, you know, I, I think man's basically good. We're not really sinners. I'm, I'm basically good. I, I don't really need salvation like these people do. Or they might disagree that Jesus is the only way to heaven. They might say, I think he's a way, but he's not the way. They're calling God a liar. They might even disagree that salvation is urgent. The Bible says now is the appointed time. Today is the day of salvation. And they might say, you know, I'll give thought to that later on in life after I've lived and enjoyed life the way I want to live it. They're calling God a liar because he's saying you need Jesus now. You need him now and you need him forever. Some might even claim that they have an intellectual disagreement with Christianity, but there are none. Ultimately, when someone disagrees with Christianity, it's not intellectual, it's moral. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. They don't want Jesus as Lord. So God says genuine salvation begins with trust in the person of Jesus alone. Secondly, genuine salvation is by grace alone. Look at verse 11. And the testimony is this, that God has, what's the next word? Given us eternal life has given us, gave it to us at a point in the past when we have believed, and it is an ongoing gift that we continue to have from him. It is a gift of God's grace. It is unmerited favor. I cannot earn it or deserve it. There is nothing inside of me that God looked down to the quarters of time and go, you know what, man, he is really cool. I think I'll have him be in my kingdom. No, God looked down to the quarters of time and saw a wretch, a sinner, someone who rejected him, someone who wanted to be his own God. And he said, I'm going to choose to save him anyway. I'm going to put my love upon him. I'm going to open his eyes to my son. It's a gift, folks. Boy, how many religions believe that? When ultimately they say, Yeah, you can have Jesus, but you need to follow these sacraments. You need to have these different pillars. You need to do this and that and the other. What if it's just Jesus? And what if it's a gift, not something you deserved? That's what he's saying here. And by the way, he says God has given us what? Eternal life. Life that lasts forever. But it's not just the length of life. It's a quality of life. And guess what? We already have it. Are you reading the same verse I'm reading? God has given us. We have it right now. We right now have a guaranteed eternity. And we have a new quality of life. This is a heavenly quality of life. This is a... uh, Sermon on the Mount, quality of life. This is just radically different than what we had before. John 17, 3, Jesus said, this is eternal life that they might know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. We now know the living God. We have a relationship with him and it lasts forevermore. And by the way, in 1 John 2, 25, he says, this is God's promise. He promised us eternal life and God has to be faithful. What is he saying here? Genuine salvation is by grace alone. You can't add anything to it. Now, if I came up and gave you a gift, then you gave me $20 for it. What would that be? Especially if I paid five bucks for it before I gave it to you. That would be kind of silly, wouldn't it? The nature of a gift is it was given free. And this is what salvation is. Come to God who gives water with no cost. The price was paid already. This is why we can have assurance. If salvation is not by grace alone, how will I ever know if I've been good enough? If it's Jesus plus, how will I ever know if I've done enough? if I've believed enough, if I've elevated myself enough spiritually, you'll never know. 
But if salvation is by grace alone, guess what? I can be assured right now and forever that I have eternal life. Amen? Amen. And that's what he's saying here. Genuine salvation begins with the person of Jesus Christ alone as Son of God. It, in, it, it by nature of God's grace alone, no human works, and focuses thirdly on the finished work of Jesus alone. Look at the last part of verse 11. And this life is in his Son. In the Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 26, Jesus said, Just as the Father has life in himself, even so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. A few verses later in verse 40, Jesus, speaking to the religious leaders of his day, said, you are unwilling to come to me so that you might have life. What is he saying? Jesus is that life. Jesus is the eternal life he gives. Jesus is the one who can give that eternal life. And the reason he's able to give us eternal life is because he's already conquered death. When he went to the cross, he paid for all sin in full. And if anyone comes to him, they pass out of death into life. They now are no longer in the kingdom of darkness. They're in the kingdom of light. They're no longer in the kingdom of the devil. They're in the kingdom of God's dear son. They, he alone can give that to you. And so it is his finished work alone. It can't be anything I do. My trust needs to be in him alone. He lived the perfect life I cannot live. He suffered and died the pay price for my sins. He rose from the grave conquering sin and death. He accomplished everything the Father sent him to do, he said in John 17, which is why he was restored back to the glory with, he, with which he ever had with God before the foundation of the world. And guess what? He's coming back soon. Maybe even before the birthday bash. I don't know. That's why Jesus can give us life. You have to believe in the finished work of Christ. So genuine salvation comes to those who believe in the person of Jesus alone, saved by his grace alone, in his finished work alone, fourthly and finally by faith alone, verse 12. He who has the Son has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. Now, I want you to notice something interesting that happens here. Everywhere else in John's gospel and everywhere else in 1 John until this point, he talks about faith in or belief in or believing in the Son. But now he changes the verb. He says, he who has the Son, what's the word? Has the life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have the life. He says it's something you can possess. You can have this. It's something that you can bring into yourself. Well, how do I possess this? I want you to think with me through the metaphors Jesus gave in the Gospels. Jesus comes along and he says, I am the bread of life. He says, another point, he goes, I am the door to the sheep. He says in another place, I am the light of the world. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. In each and every case, he is the source from which we receive God's gift. Does that make sense? We believe in him. Now think about this. If he's the bread of life, how do I believe in him? What do you do with bread that impacts your body? You eat it. Now as long as it's keto bread, I'll join you. But uh, if it's not, I can't have it. You consume it. What does that bread become inside of you? Life. It gives you life. And he's saying here, believing in Jesus is to consume him so that he is your life. That's what believing is. How many multitudes of people have given an intellectual assent to Jesus? That's nice. Jesus is just all right with me. You know what? Someday, by and by, but they have not consumed him as their very life. They have not surrendered to him as their Lord. Jesus is saying here, John is saying here, 
if you truly have possessed the Son, your life is now defined by Him. He has given you true life. To have the Son is to possess Him as Savior and Lord. So let me sum up. Salvation is a person. It's not a belief system. It's not a religion. It's a person. And that person is God of all eternity, Son of God, God-man, Christ the Messiah, who came down and suffered and died for us so that he might grant us forgiveness. And the only way you can have that eternal life he offers is to come to him by grace alone, through faith alone, in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ alone. Does that make sense? That's John's message. So what? What do we do with this? Can I remind you that this is a test? This is a test. And by the way, John wants you to pass. <laughs> That's the positive side. He wants you to know that you know that you know that you have eternal life and have heavenly joy as a result. So I ask you the question, what do you believe about the person and work of Jesus Christ? Do you believe God's testimony? Is his testimony clear? From Genesis to Revelation, is his testimony clear? And is the Holy Spirit confirming that testimony? So what do you believe about the person and work of Jesus Christ? Is he the Son of God, the God-man, the Messiah, the Savior of the world? Do you believe that he came to fully identify with you, live the sinless life you can't live, pay the price for your sin on the cross, rise from the dead demonstrating he's the Son of God and the only Son of God, the only Savior? And do you believe that he is able to give life to all who come to him? Do you believe that? Because if you don't, no matter how religious you are, you're calling God a liar. Secondly, what have you done with the clear testimony of God about the person and work of Jesus Christ? You've heard this before. This is not new information. You've heard this before, but what have you done with it? Have you personally received Christ? Have you turned from sin and trusted in him alone? Have you invited him in to be the Lord of your life and given yourself to follow him? That's the right response. And by the way, this is urgent. Please, if you have not done it yet, whether you're in here or you're watching online, if you've not done this yet, would you please do it right now? This is urgent. I've done so many funerals lately, I understand the reality of death of all different ages. If coming to Jesus is life, why are you putting it off? Why not have life today? Thirdly, assurance is found in and only in Jesus. If you pass this test, you can have heavenly joy. You can go to bed rejoicing that God always forgives you, always loves you, has a place in his kingdom for you. You can rest in Jesus and enjoy eternal life right now. And if that's true of you, the one thing you're gonna to wanna to do more than anything else is tell others about it, amen? Because you're gonna want everybody to experience the testimony of the Spirit of God and trust in Christ and be born again and know it forever and ever and ever, amen? So Father, we thank you for John's clear message to us this testimony of the baptism and the death of Christ, revealing to us who he is. I thank you, Father, this is not just a bunch of beliefs. It's a person. It's the God-man that we trust in. And we are so grateful that he is omnipotent and that he can and will and already has delivered us from the wrath to come. How we pray, if there's anybody here who has not yet trusted in Christ, that they, they don't got Jesus. How I pray, he would become their very life. They would open their eyes. Your spirit would open their eyes to see that Jesus matters more than anyone or anything in this world. And they would realize who he is and what he's done. 
Oh, Father, open eyes even this moment. Bring people to yourself. Cause them to be born again in the trust and give them that assurance of eternal life. For those that have known you for a long time, would you just remind us of these things that we might celebrate anew? We know for sure we're yours and will be forevermore. Thank you for making this so clear in Jesus' name.